firmly believe that any man's finest hour, the greatest fulfillment of all that he holds dear, is that moment when he has worked his heart out in a good cause and lies exhausted on the field of battle, victorious. At West Rock Coffee, we celebrate the determination and spirit of the people of Rwanda who help us make the finest coffee in the world. Wow, good morning, good afternoon. Welcome to my show, my weekly Tuesday live show where we talk about trade with Africa and diaspora affairs. My name is Toyin Yumesiri. I'm the CEO of Nazaru LLC. And today I have a special guest, Mr. Sam Onanda from the African Chamber of Commerce out of Shanghai. But today he's joining us from the UK because of COVID, but it's usually based in Shanghai, China. Say hello, good evening to you. <laughs> yes, um, calling from the UK. Uh, hello, everybody. Hello, world, uh, wherever you are. <laughs> a pleasure to be joining you. Happy 2021. Hope you've all started the year well. Fantastic. I've been looking forward to today, right? Because the conversation we're having today is so absolutely dynamic. We'll talk about um, the US-China trade war, right? What does that mean for private sector in China, in the US? We also talk about the impact <clears throat> on African trade. Um, one thing I also want to dive in, we're going to dive into, a deep, I mean, a lot of topics. We also want to talk about China-Africa relations. What does that look like? Um, what are the governments of China? How do you partner with them? Um, what do they have in place to support private sector engagement, China, Africa? And then I'll share my own perspective in terms of U.S. engagement, and then we'll go from there. How does that sound? Sounds good. Fantastic. Very well planned. I'm excited. Okay. <laughs> thank you. So thank you to everyone joining us from around the world. You know, here's the thing. Myself and um, Sam, we have conversations offline, but today you have the honor to listen in <laughs> and um, do drop a comment. I see Tama joining. Good morning. Ba um, Bashkar Gush from Calcutta, India. Thank you for joining today. We're really so, ex I'm so excited. And the topic is, I mean, dynamic in nature. So first of all, Mr. Sam, COVID, <laughs> COVID-19. Um, yes. You've been, you, you know, you kind of witnessed it starting in China and, you know, now as it's gone through the world. What are your thoughts? How, how has it impacted um, international trade from your perspective? Yes, well, I think um, on a business level, a lot of entrepreneurs such as myself, we, we changed our strategy to support more healthcare initiatives. Um, mm -hmm. The African Chamber of Commerce were involved in the Million Masks initiatives to Senegal where we were exporting PPE and other health equipment for communities in need. I think all that COVID-19 has done for Africa is just allowed us to focus on the healthcare initiatives and the healthcare mm. problems that we need to solve. Um, there are a variety of different um, opportunities that have come about that. So mm. I don't necessarily see COVID-19 as something that should hold up the mm. opportunities of investing in Africa. I think it should just move them and reallocate them from what they were traditionally involved into more um, healthcare um, opportunities that have just become more and more available with uh, COVID-19. I know that sounds very opportunistic, but I think that <laughs> you know we have to we have to react to the market. Uh, we can't all stop and stand still and wait. We just have to see how the market is moving and move with the market. We have to always uh, work with the waves rather than try to work against them. Absolutely. And when you talk about to opportunistic, like business is about, you know, taking advantage of opportunity to bring value to the marketplace. And when your customers shift, you know, you should shift. I mean, yeah, exactly. I mean, it, for me, it's like normal. It's just like when we saw like, luxury brands that used to manufacture perfumes shift to and it's like i know it's new but when you're disrupted you've got to be ad adaptable and, and let me take a moment to kind of officially or formally just share a little bit about your bio which i missed earlier so um, mr Salmon Nanda is a business development manager at the african chamber of commerce and the general manager of the African Marketplace Project. He has been working with the African Chamber of Commerce since 2017, before being appointed to his business development manager role. So 
Um, I, I also want to encourage people to look you up, look up your website if they want to find out more information. Okay, here's the thing that really, really fascinates me with the work that you do. Your work is diaspora led. You know, the first time we took, spoke, um, some, I mean, months ago now, where I was trying to understand your structure, right? The work you do in China. And I was super excited to see it's diaspora led, meaning African led initiative that works with the um, Chinese government to drive trade. So bilateral, right? Import and yeah. export. You do and do both, both, right? So how has it been? How, how, how has it been for you being a diaspora? Because just like myself, being a like, diaspora leading um, African affairs, because it should be a no brainer, right? But we don't see that often. Non-Africans yes. do do it more. Yes, I think um, maybe I should compare my time in the UK with my time in China. Obviously, I I'm bo I was born in Kenya, but I grew up in the UK, and I've worked in um, I've lived in China for exactly the same amount of time. So, um, I think it's important to understand the circumstances that create the necessity for a diaspora-led organization when you don't see any other alternative to your growth, your development, um, how you contribute to society, you have to create your own space to do so. And mm. it's in this kind of um, enterprising attitude that you develop your own businesses and you start supporting other businesses that require that experience or want to tap into your experience. So that's the environment in which the African Chamber of Commerce initially started. Then, of course, because as we were dealing with larger and larger deals, we started getting involved with governments. And in doing so, we were able to tap into both the domestic within China, as well as international outside of China, the, um, with the embassies help in Beijing, um, the various African embassies help in Beijing. And in doing so, we were able to network with both the diaspora in China, but also diaspora around the world, and obviously Africa, the host continents, the homeland, uh, homeland. We network and develop our business. Um, we've taken advantage of the opportunities that are available. There are economic and policy initiatives that have uh, aligned with our strategy. The Forum for China Africa Cooperation, okay. the, yeah. China, yeah, the China Africa Economic Trade Expo, the Belt and Road Initiative. These are all uh, policy initiatives that have encouraged these kinds of engagements, but you'll understand as well that these are Chinese-led initiatives. And this is a really big problem. We should have African-led <laughs> initiatives. <laughs> you want to go there? Okay, well, let's no, go I, there. Let's I, go I would, there. Okay. I, I would say it's something that we need. I, I don't okay, let, let's, let's go there. Here, here's the thing. You and I were talking offline before we started. Yeah. Not like a lot of export development initiatives are not African government-led. Why? <laughs> um, all right, so I'm, I'm going to borrow. Um, I'm going to borrow a phrase from Donald Rumsfeld: "Unknown unknowns." Um, unknown so, unknowns. So you know there there's things that we we don't know. Sorry, but there are things we know. There are things that we don't know. There are things we cannot know, and there are things that we do not like to know or don't mm. want to face. And um, I believe that the export strategy is in that latter point um okay. there is always going to be a um political ambition that will drive the export strategy and wow. with yeah there, there, that's always going to be the case in in china's um in china's case it's exactly the same thing the u.s china trade war led china's export strategy so they said okay this is the political scenario we're in we're going to change our strategy to support other economical right economic right strategy. right and the way i describe that is if you squeeze china enough they need to make up those numbers so if us reduces its trade with china china is not going to reduce its gdp or its act internal activities the only thing you're going to do is they're going to spread they're going to look for other regions <laughs> in the world to make up those numbers and and it's just it's like what do they talk about there's a particular insect like if you make a mistake and step that insect you're just giving you're just allowing it to propagate like propagates for you're just spreading 
you just spread in it. So that's one of the things that I've seen that the aggressiveness of the US-China trade war has actually increased the determination of, of China to penetrate Africa and to get closer to Africa. I've also seen it with the UK. You're in the UK. Look at the um, British exit. That as well has given rise to um, some new dynamic engagement between the British and African nations that I think if the exit didn't happen, it would have been like an afterthought, right? Yeah. But when, yeah. when you lose numbers, when you lose those economic numbers, export numbers, and if you don't make up those numbers, your economy would tank. Literally, that's what it is. Like your private sector export development, their markets, is, markets are closing up to them. You've got to look for new markets to distribute those products, right? And then coming back to Africa, personally, I, I, I sometimes I think that not everybody, whether diaspora, African private sector or African government, may not really understand what is at stake in terms of the numbers and what the potential is. Let me explain. I worked for Walmart, and one of the reasons I, I started Nazaru was because I saw the numbers, right? When it comes to global sourcing implementation and um, you know trade at scale, I know what the numbers look like. And within those numbers, what governs international trade I wasn't seeing um, African private sectors selling or showing up in the room. So literally, Africa is not part of the game in terms of that skill, right? That skill that China is operating in, that the rest of the world is operating. And that, having that vantage point, I think is what would be a game changer for the region. Because if you know what you're going after, then you can invest in it, right? That's like absolutely it's, right. That's exactly. Right. I think I think what's happening on the continent is true. There are individual nations nations are branching out. Rwanda, South Africa, and um, Ghana. Ghana. They've all had fantastic mm -hmm. export strategies internationally, not just within the continent, but also internationally. Um, obviously, Nigeria as well. Um, I think <laughs> yeah, Nigeria yeah, is. <laughs> Oh, I think Nigeria's number one export. I know many people will say, obviously, they're, they're oh. uh, oil and so on, but their number one export for me, people. Everywhere people. you go Good. over the okay. world, people. They have done extremely well wherever they are, and they continue to be the, the drivers of Nigerian economy overseas. So because Diaspora. they're exporting their people, yeah, exactly. Because they have those connections overseas they should be tapping into them but that as we said that comes that has to come from policy that has to come from the top so because of that political ambition or lack of a political lack ambition from the top we, we have to we have to wait you have to do it ourselves and i think right. um you know maybe in the future things will change hopefully they do hopefully they'll see what guys like yourselves are doing and they'll tap into you as a resource and say hey <laughs> We see what you're doing in the USA. Let's see if we can leverage our political capital using your connections. That's well, what every other nation is doing. That's what, true, true. But here's the, for, for me, sometimes I know what the ideal scenario, which is what we're describing. We know what the ideal is, but yeah. we have to have our feet planted on ground in reality. And as yeah, it true. is right now, the reality of this moment, given conversations I'm part of, the reality of this moment is that a whole lot of African countries and African governments rely primarily on donor, foreign aid. There are projects that they should be running right now to drive their exports that they tell me, Toyin, go and find us a donor fund to fund our exports. And I'm like, <laughs> really? You, 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 you still think, even after COVID, that the donor fund that you're receiving is going to be used to help you drive your export. No, you're mistaken. A lot of times people don't know that when, it, when donors come through your front door, you need to ask yourself, what's getting out of your back door? <laughs> like take that money, but know what you're negotiating. Exactly, it's a huge problem. It's a really it's big a huge, problem. But that's, but, but that's the problem. And there's this, I don't know if it's still part of the post-colonial mindset, that says help is coming from abroad. 
that um, the work at hand in our community to drive the exports from this community to mobilize the private sector, somebody out there, UN, World Bank, this, that, that, is going to give us the funds to do it. But they are borrowing money, okay, for, for foreign entities to do certain projects. Like, I'm just, it's like when you say you're burning the candle from both ends. I really don't get it. Maybe you can help me explain what's going on. <laughs> well, I think that strategy um, has worked in the past. Therefore, there is past. a precedent for it. But I think nowadays, as I would say since the turn of the century, things are slowly changing. Um, China, for example, has um, encouraged the use of um, their raw material demand as collateral for raising credit with certain mm. projects. So okay. you have situations where you will have oil or cocoa used as the credit um, facility. So the to production, raise funds almost like the production. Yeah. Or, okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I think this needs to happen on a, okay, it's happening right now on a government and a state level. But I don't see why it shouldn't happen on a private level as well. Why not? If someone privately owns land, if someone privately has a collateral, they have a, a background of 5, 10, 20, 30 years of, exp of, of producing a tangible, tradable item or service, a product or service, then a bank can say, okay, I'll take your KYC, I'll understand how you do your business, and I'll use this, um, this background or this... Uh, this tangible um, product that you produce or this tangible service that you produce give you credit so you can export. Trade finance could be yes, the future. Even, yeah, even what you just described, sometimes it doesn't even have to be that complex. I think the private sector may not have this deep understanding that it doesn't even have to be that way. Like that's still complex. You still have assets. But one, one of the things I've also seen at the highest scale level is you can actually use a PO to go to the bank. So what it means is once you have a deal on the on the table, you've gotten a buyer interested in your product, you've gotten a purchase order, whether for now or in the future, that PO, actually, you can take it to a bank. Like a PO from, I wouldn't mention names, from a certain company is as good as money in the bank. Like in Chinese banks now, you take that PO to any bank because it's, it's, it's a legal agreement that you'll be paid in the future for services rendered or for products created. So what you just yeah. described is one, but I've also seen the other part where if you have a deal on table that says in 2022, a company is interested in doing business with you and you have a purchase agreement to buy this volume, you can actually take that to finance the production of those products. I think that's very true. A little worried about the... The, the document uh, veracity, but I think after the KYC, the bank will definitely provide the credit based also on the collateral. So that yes. goes back to wh what, what tangible collateral you're going to offer up in exchange for that credit. Exactly. But yeah, you know, this is Africa. Africa has those tangibles. You know, we have the commodities, we have the gold, we have the, we have the timber, we have the silver, we have the nickel, we have the chromium, we have the fruits, the vegetables, I'm big in commodities, we have the coffee. Just even the arbitrage of having the item settled in a bonded warehouse overseas, that's already creating value. So right. it just I just think that the, 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 the political environment needs to be educated on these opportunities so that they can push these kinds of objectives. Agenda. On a, yeah, exactly. Right. So, so it's, it's, two, yeah. it's, it's the political agenda and the political yeah. will. But yeah. there's a, like I was saying before we joined, like there's a lot of education or misinformation out there yeah. that yeah. even the private sector, um, I don't know how, how nice I could say this, but with my engagements with the African, you know, diaspora or African, even private sector, mm -hmm. something keeps crop, cropping up. It's like a lot of times it's like they want to outsource their responsibility. Like, why is this person not doing this or that person not doing this? Well, my question is, why is it not you? Why are you not doing this? You need yeah. to just, yeah. So it's, I don't know why. Why are we sure. outsourcing yeah. this, this work that has to happen? Who's going to do the work? 
because uh, people have not seen enough examples of it. I think mm -hmm. with the China International Import Expo or with more African expos in America, we w once these um, uh, the stakeholders they see these kind of activities happening and they see how other countries are making money from it. So, for example, in China we have uh, uh, import mall. Uh, and we are using private investments to fund this import mall, but mm -hmm. all of our competitors, Canada, Argentina, Ecuador, Mexico, they're all using state funding mm -hmm. to finance it. So we're already on the back foot because of our background and our history and our ability to bring the products to market. But Quickly. Yeah, exactly. But they are they already have the product in market they already have the packaging and now they have the state funding so because we don't have all those components in place we're, we're like we're playing we're boxing with one arm behind our back it's 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 just not yeah it's like not america has an agenda and it is fully yeah. funded by the american government like like yeah. i mean the strength of america is is that's really the bottom line is like the government is full like the private sector has the attention of the government, whether you're a small, an SME in a, in, in IDAO or, you know, it's middle historical. of nowhere, right? Arkansas, like you, you, you have, you, you know where to go, the systems are in place, the resources are in place to support you wherever you are in the US, which is the power of the economy here. Most people do not have that, but okay, here's the thing, switching a little bit. I feel sometimes that your job is easier than mine. <laughs> well, um, I think that because, for example, the Chinese government is incentivizing um, African trade for the African diaspora, even in China, the Chinese government is investing in the African diaspora in in China. Where else is that happening? No. Where else? Where else Which is, is the problem? space being provided for the diaspora to create? Um, um, tradable items, opportunities for um, um, showrooms. Where, where else in the world is this happening? So, you, 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 of course, I can argue about Africa and so on. But you know, I've been in the UK. I don't see it happening. Um, I, I, I very rarely see it happening in the UK. Uh, it's just slowly starting to happen now. Maybe it's because the diaspora are starting to engage in these kinds of businesses. And in the past, they haven't. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe the diaspora need to push themselves. Are they mm. engaging in enterprises at the same level as what mm. is expected of them? So, mm. you know, it's, it, there's a lot that needs to be pushed. There's a lot that needs mm. to be incentivized. There's a lot that needs to be moving in the right direction. And perhaps all the pieces are in the right place in China, but perhaps they're not in the right place in other locations. Right. So what I was also going to say was in the past, there's a history where, for example, all the captains of industry were funded by that government who were in charge. You'd have mm -hmm. like Rockefeller who had the power of the US government. So when he was moving standard oil products around the world, he had the he had a blank Access, check written yeah. by the US government, you know? So when we talk about the captains of industry of today, what kind of support can we give them? What kind of um, criteria is mm. required for governments to invest in these kinds of public-private partnerships? Wow. Okay, this is quite interesting, which is taking me back to where, why I created the Trade with Africa Business Summit and what we've done. It's now in its fourth year. Part of what I realized were that um, was that, one, there are government resources, but it's almost like if you're not in the know, you don't know. Like if you're not in DC and you're not in that cycle, you really don't know what's going on. So when I ventured out and I started engaging with the government, US government, I realized that there were resources, but the information about those resources do not reside in the diaspora community. So it's like, there are two ways. There are resources, but the diaspora community is not engaged. So when it comes to community engagement, um, especially here, I'm talking about U.S., right? The U.S. African diaspora, we are very successful as individuals, but as a group, as a collective unit, we do not show up to do things, right? So it's almost like you don't, when you don't have um, um, political capital, you're not forming major impactful or influential associations, um, like what you're doing, like, People don't see you, so people don't 
build policies with you in mind. That's the way US is. It's like when you show up as a group, as a collective unit, you are able to um, advocate on behalf of your group, not on behalf of an individual, but on behalf of your group by the government. And that's how you tap into government resources. That is something I also advise the private sector entities and chambers of commerce in Africa to do. If you want, if you want your government, even whether in the US or in Africa, to respond to your need, the private sector must mobilize itself and must advocate on behalf of that unit. Because as an individual, unless you're Dagote or you're this, Tony Elumelu, the government doesn't respond to an individual. They respond to a collective unit, which is what I've seen in the diaspora we've not done. So part of my platform, we brought in the US Exim Bank. So you talked about financing. There are resources, and I have hours and hours of content on this information, right? Again, the diaspora, they, I mean, this is me saying, Oftentimes, even when you provide the information, they are not curious enough to, to digest that information. But this is what I've done. The, um, the U.S. Export Import Bank has resources to finance U.S. export, not import, right? To finance exports from U.S. to Africa. We brought them in. We brought um, vendors, suppliers. They've worked in. I have that content. Also, I brought in, um, you know, part of the, the African equivalents, right? the Africa Exim Bank, African Export Import Bank, to come and talk about what they do in Africa to finance trade. Brought them together, they talked. In fact, my platform was where they both connected. They didn't know each other existed, and since then, they've taken their relationships to the next level. I've brought in USAID, Department of Commerce, USTDA, all of these agencies that drive trade. But again, I think the US government is not doing enough for community engagement, for community sensitization. They should be funding the work that I do, a, at least a portion of it, because it's advocating to drive US Africa trade. They see, they come, and they leave, which is Absolutely. my own, uh, <laughs> you know, it's like un unbelievable, right? But on the African side as well, it's the same. The government needs to fund platforms that advocates for trade, because when your private sector can push and produce and export, either from US to Africa or Africa to US or from Canada or Latin America, because I get pulled into those regions as well, everybody wins. Everybody wins. But the government, <laughs> the government, I think it's, it's, they need to own up to those responsibilities anyway. That's what I think. I think, I think the, these institutions are definitely in existence, in, in existence yeah. as you said. Um, I think the disconnect absolutely is knowledge, but I think mm. also, as I said, um, there's other motivations which will create roadblocks. So, mm. you know, everybody, everybody wants to be the president of Africa, but they don't, <laughs> understand, they don't understand that they have to have a cabinet, they have mm. to have other people who are not members of the government to, mm help them out. So mm -hmm. I think there needs to definitely be a connect between the public and the private sector. Organizations mm -hmm. such as ourselves, the African Chamber of Commerce, yourself as well, and Nizaru, absolutely, it's what we do. We lobby mm -hmm. on behalf of the private um, private enterprises as well as public enterprises. Mm -hmm. But there needs to be a connect. There really right. needs to be a connect. And, right. when it, and for there to be a connect, um, there needs to be knowledge. There needs to be a right. certain level of Humility to say, I, mm -hmm. I don't actually know if I know what I'm doing. And I don't mm -hmm. expect the presidents uh, to understand that. I don't expect so the, the small leaders to be able to say, you know, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's just not going to happen. Let's let's just be honest. Right. Like, so rather, yeah. we, we need to start promoting ourselves. The platforms that we create, they need to be much higher level. We need to be out there on a much, much, uh, we need to broadcast. We need to be on TV. We need to be much louder. And I, I think that's when uh, people take notice. Um, yeah. I don't just mean just creating a noise. I mean, implementing strategic um, trade facilitation that it creates opportunities locally as well as internationally. And right. when these leaders can tap into that, they're like, oh, you already got something that I can invest in. Great. Right. I'll send over a delegate to exactly. open doors for Ex you. Happy exactly. Day. 
Exactly. Because because what I do not consider what I do as love. I do not lobby. Like one of my friends, John Rosenberg, you know, in Washington, D.C., was my speaker two, two weeks ago. So lobby is, is something else. What I do really is I create platforms, platforms mm -hmm. to engage for trade, actual buying and selling, platforms for education, platforms for networking, relationship building. Um, platforms to also advocate, right? So those are what I would say, like the four things that I do, because I've realized that when I started and built Nazaru, you know, I begin with the hand in mind, I was already operating at a certain level, but I, I, I met a lot of immaturity within the African global trade conversation, where there was a lot of chatter, okay? There were a lot of conversation, but when you look at the number, it doesn't add up. OK, everybody's talking about AFCFTA now. There's a lot of noise. But when, but for me, my first degree is mathematics. So I'm like, show me the number. Like, who is doing what? You talked about Nigeria exporting its diaspora. Here's the thing. Nigeria is gravely underperforming when you look at the number and its potential, right? You, Kenya is actually outperforming Nigeria with exports. When you think about productivity, if you say 44 million people produced X, Y, Z, 200 million people is producing less than 44 million in certain products, right? Nigeria's big export is oil, but we know where oil is right now. So when Nigeria wakes up, and I think it's trying, <laughs> but there's still work to do. I think the entire world would shake in the sense that the potential Absolutely. that that nation carries, it's Absolutely. massive. It's massive. I, I'm I telling you, Nigeria is sitting on, on, on incredible natural resources, land mass, the people, the oil, the resources, the capacity. Wow. But <laughs> until <I agree>. then. <laughs> we actually have a event planned in... The, in September, um, sponsored by the Chinese government. Hopefully, okay. it's also sponsored by the I Nigerian need to move government. To China. The Chinese yeah. government is sponsoring everything. Yeah, well, you're lucky. You're lucky. They, I think they see the potential. I think exactly. that's what it is because they see the potential. They're investing in it, and mm. I think that's the difference. Yes. You know, a lot, when when you when you talk to other people about Africa, you'll always hear about their their skepticism. negative experiences, yeah, and the skepticism, but when you talk to Chinese entrepreneurs about Africa, they'll they always talk about yeah, yeah, they always talk about how much money they made when they went there. Ooh. So yeah, it's it's just like okay, um, I know that you know that everybody in Africa knows that, but other people don't know that. The people who can make things happen just don't seem to know that, uh, mm. and there, there's a little too much skepticism even locally um, in terms of at the key decision level. There's a, a little bit of doubt as to whether we can achieve that potential, and that's mm. I think our, our biggest. Uh, let do you mean down. the? Do you mean Chinese or African in terms of meeting that potential? Where's the concern? What meeting the potential? No, I think mm. uh, I think China already has a twenty-year plan to to meet their objective in Africa. I, I, wow. I have absolutely. I just like I'm like a remora fish just swimming in that slipstream. I, I'm, wow. I'm, not, I'm not worried about that. Um, I talk about other markets where there are there's just not enough. Um, so okay, we talked about UK Africa. Now they see the potential. Now things are happening. But in the past, why wasn't that happening? Mm -hmm. Was it really because they were in the EU? Was that really what was, was the issue? I'm not sure. So mm -hmm. I'm happy that they've achieved or they've seen the potential that was already there. You talked about America having its own export financing organization. The UK has its own export financing organization. So if it's already and always had this organization, why ha why is it just now that they're realizing that there's this fantastic opportunity? Uh, yeah, I think it's the... yeah, it's a blend. One of the things, one of the limitations of the Af um, US agenda, it's America first. So if people come into Africa and you're saying America first, do you really want to hear that? Well, and, I think, and, um, and Exim, the Exim Bank, only the export side functions. They do not finance import into the U.S. It's true. Yes. Uh, well, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the various African countries definitely have the money to export their goods to American ports. 
Um, I'm already working with uh, Fruit South Africa. They've negotiated with the various ports in, Brun in uh, Savannah, Georgia, and Carolina as well to get their goods into, um, into America. They're enjoying AGOA's duty-free access into the American market. So there's definitely the resources to do it, but it's about marketing and it's about long-term Branding. strategy. Branding, yes. even something as simple as packaging. We can't be looking at packaging from the, um, uh, the, 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 lack, the lackluster um, look of a product. We have to see made in Africa. We need to see that and say that this product makes right. us proud. So absolutely, um, there needs to be more of a push in right. the long-term strategy of having a product in or service in a foreign market, but also allowing right. access in that market. I, I love this. Yeah, we, we were talking about also within Africa, you know, Nigeria can, can do business in Kenya, Kenya can do business in Nigeria. We can also have that strategy now with the AFCTA. If, they're too, if there's fear or doubt or skepticism in moving overseas, let's start having the conversation of getting these products into various African markets. Why not? Exactly. And, and this is music to my ears because, you know, when it comes to retail, okay, and this is where education comes in, right? Working for the world's largest retail, I also have my own products that I'm moving in. But people want the results, but they think it's easy, but they don't want to do the work. So when I talk about export development, markets inside, markets development as well, market entry development, people don't understand what that means. They think, I want to export and that's it. I want to export and that's it, right? So you and I know that it actually takes months of strategy development and laying out that strategy and then executing. You think about the supply chain streamlining and all, which is where my background is. So when I say trade with Africa, people assume that it's just a let's talk. No, one point for talking, nine points for doing. It's all the work that happens behind the scene to look at the, for example, I teach um, around like understanding the US market, you know, market insights. What are people buying? Because in retail, when I work for Walmart, Walmart knows more about the US than anybody, right? In terms of what people are buying, what the sizes are, what their taste is like, like that is really market insight. And those are the things that you need to use to bring products in. So for example, US does not like South African wine. Okay. It's been tested. It's been proven because it was, it was fermented for European tastes, but, but they don't know that. So they brought South African wine with pride into the US market and it's rejected. Like when I say rejected, the only people that would want to drink it are South Africans living in the US that it's like they have this, you know, feel of own, oh, like, let me, let me drink what I'm so used to. But the American um, average consumer cannot tolerate it because it's too sweet. They're not used to it. So two things has to happen from a retail standpoint. Either you spend a bunch of marketing dollars to tell people why South African wine is the best thing, right? So that they can, they can start talking about South African wine, like they do Italian spaghetti, Italian sauce. Like Italian sauce tastes different, right? But people are gotten used to it and, and they attribute it to Italy, right? Either you spend that marketing dollar to educate the American consumer about what you're bringing in, or you go back to the drawing board, master what they already drink, go back to your farm and start, it might take two, three, how many years, then start producing the wine that the market is looking for. Like those are the two parts. But again, people don't want to do the research. They want the results and they think it's magic. No, it doesn't happen that way. Yeah. I think if we take a look at the French example in China, you know, the Chinese market, they don't drink red wine. But mm. all of a sudden, China has magically built this appetite for French red wine. What happened? What happened? What happened? Marketing. Was, yeah, France spent millions into uh, marketing, sending brand ambassadors all over China to educate the, the Chinese palate on French red wine. Yes. Scotland did exactly the same thing with whiskey. Good friend of mine, John Campbell, who's over at, um, well, now he started his own business, but he was over at Duvars. He was, and Bacardi and Diageo. He was all mm. over China. Luxury. There was an expo, summit. He was hitting different locations. There are 623 cities in China. Wow. He hit them all Ooh. just to promote Scottish whiskey in, in China. 
now people are drinking whiskey. It's it's in shops. It's in your corner shop. You can get Scottish whiskey, um, Ballantines, um, Macallan. You can get a whole different types of uh, Scottish whiskeys in the corner shops in China. And it's purely because of this marketing. But that exactly. means that any other brand, any other whiskey can now just say, we're also whiskey. We have this taste for this. One. Yeah, but you know, it's just it's swimming in that slipstream. Yes. So they've done the hard work. So, so here's the thing where, where where I kind of envy you. Like you have that stream and you're just swimming. For me, I'm literally creating an industry that doesn't exist. Like I'm a lone wolf. <laughs> I feel you and I think you feel that, me? Um, hopefully, you know, I take all the I mean, credit. Uh, I, I, I take all the credit. Um, I, I hope <laughs> on, you do. Um, I really hope you do. I think with the American market, you really have to tap into the local African Americans. I think that um, that will drive the interest. Um, I, I was reading about how a cigar company had tapped into uh, black and the Black Lives Matter movement, and he'd used the outrage to funnel interest into his cigars and it's he he started um he started on instagram and the social media following was just huge now i also working with a cigar company in zimbabwe and that's a great opportunity he can use to access the american market this cigar company has already done all the hard work of getting his uh, right, market right. interested in cigars. So all you have to do is now put yourself beside that cigar company. If they yes. want to buy American, great. If they want to buy tobacco from the world's most famous tobacco tobacco farms in 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 Zimbabwe, they have that option opportunity as well. But because they're right beside each other, you now have access to that market. Yes. I'm just saying that that kind of education where you are. Um, you understand how to access that market. You know your route to market. Yes. The long-term strategy as well behind that. That education is something I'm very happy that you're yes. doing. And, and, and <laughs> do, do you know what? Yeah, do you know what I had to do? So this year, 2021, is dedicated to, um, we actually launched a, a school of international trade. Like Nazaru had to. Because everything you're talking about, like this is, this is the work. You and I, we're on the same page. But the community that we're building to do this work and to invest in this space and to mobilize, that we're trying to mobilize. When you spend time with them, like you almost have to go to Export 101. But this is this is business, isn't it? This is this is just the way business yeah, is. Yeah, I, I now teach like business development. Like I, that's one thing that happened for me. 2020, last year was for me, taking a moment. Like most people had to reflect, right? And my own reflection was like towing. You're talking about trade with Africa and you're running. Like I have my, my skincare line, my beauty line. I'm doing my own thing. And it was like towing. Take a look at you, at your back and look at the community that is following you. Spend time to listen to them and assess the maturity level. If they even understand what it is you're trying to say, right? Because we now have a global following. And I have a global following. Like... Thousands of people around the world followed it, followed this work. And that's why even this show, Nazaro.tv, was created. Like, if you go to Nazaro.tv, you see a bunch of content. The reason I've invested time in building this educative platform is because when we're building an army, if you don't equip them with the right knowledge, you, you and I know international trade is close to warfare in the sense of livelihood, right? When you think about the phrase China... China trade, US China trade for trade war. The reason that strong language is used because your livelihood is at stake, right? When you're negotiating tariffs, it's the livelihood of your private sector, but people, our people are not there yet. So what I've also done is to categorize the types of people that we can help. So if you go to nazaru.com, you see the categories of people we work with. So there's a lot of, I also teach, policy leaders in Africa, because a lot of the policies they're implementing favors international players. And they say, oh, why is my GDP not growing? Well, are you focused on export development? Are you investing in your private sector, right? So they also have to take a look at their policies. Also AFCFTA implementation. 
most people do not know what it means at the grassroots level of implementation. So I also play that role there. But there's also exporters that are ready today that we work with to help them build out the strategy, market entry strategy. And then there are trade facilitators that they're not the buyer, they're not the seller, they're supposed to be as mature as you and I, but they're not. But they, but they want to be. So how do we, like, I, I guess, let me make this a question. What activities do you uh, put, do you have in place? How do you educate your clients, your member base? What process do you take them through so that when you're, when you're working with them, they already know what to expect? So we have um, made it part of the value added chain. Um, we make, we make value addition um, part of the trade process. Okay. Quality control and supply chain management to access the Chinese market. Um, mm. Because we can talk, we can use this kind of discussion at the source, we can handle, so we say the Chinese market need this Okay. at the source. Okay, so, so, so break, let me help me break this down. This conversation, you're having it with Africa or you're having it with a private sector in China. Break it down. Oh, we do it both sides. We do it okay. both sides. We okay. do it both sides. So, for example, from the Chinese side, we'll say Africans produce this. Uh, this is when you should buy. Um, and this is the quality so, that they will have ready for you. Let's take this slowly. That yeah, is market okay. intelligence. So you yeah. do provide market intelligence to your client to say, from what we know of the landscape, these are the types of things that is in demand from Africa, right? And this That's is the right. season. Okay, it's the same. Yeah. It's the same thing I have. Okay, go, go. On. I'm gonna okay. just let's take it slow. Let's break it down. <laughs> yeah, of course. No, okay, that's exactly right. Please that's go on. And, right. and sorry, sorry if it seems like I'm interrupting you. It's because this no. is so important. This is important. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the, the more you understand, um, the the more the read the the viewers understand, the more they can tap into the exact same knowledge later on. So Fantastic. There's uh, that's from the Chinese side. Uh, on the on the African side, we'll say when the when is the most marketable opportunity for a specific uh, item um, to be harvested? So um, we'll handle the quality control of the item in Africa and say these quality items need to be available at this time so that this market is able to purchase them. Ah. Okay. Okay. Go. Go on. Go on. I have questions, but go on. <laughs> no problem. Because there shouldn't really be any waste. Let's say, for example, if you're so right now we're doing um, citrus fruits um, during the South African harvest. You've got Class A, Class One, the best quality citrus fruits that would be great for juicing and creating um, soft drinks in China. So that's the best time to buy them because it's fresh. Two weeks. They're in Chinese ports and into um, the facilities that will process the oranges and so on. But how about class two, class three? They still need to be bought. So those ones that are now rolled over can now be in time for when you have the flavorings or the fragrances or the other markets that use citrus fruits. So you have to time it. You have to say, okay, this quality is good for this time of the year. This quality is good for this time of year. Let's manage the supply chain so that it's available for such and such a time where the customers are actually ready to buy it. Yep. So here is, here's one question. I'm, I'm making some assumption, but let me ask it. It's like this scenario you're describing, both sides of the coin, are they both your clients? Are Absolutely. you matchmaking? Absolutely. Because that's, that's exactly, the only time this can work. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's that's exactly what the African Chamber of Commerce does. Our membership yeah. comprises of, and this is another way of quality control. We can say our members are qualified members. They are members of the China Association of Trade and Services. They're a member of the China Council of Promotion of International Trade. That's how they became members. We have them as buyers. They are members of the African Chamber of Commerce. At the same time, when we talk to the the Chinese side were able to say, hey, take a look at these buyers, sorry, these suppliers in Africa. Uh, they are members of, and we'll talk, for example, Kenya will have the AFA, the Agricultural Food Authority, or they're members of a certain directorate and so on. In, in uh, South Africa, we'll talk about the Food South Africa. We'll talk about their membership in the Food South Africa, different organizations and so on. Because they come recommended. Exactly. We're able to do business. 
So it's all exactly. about making those timings, um, yep. just and then that's how we get the right customers in place. Uh, it's it's you know I don't want to say it's an exact science, but matchmaking is oh, it's an art. It's an art. It's it's, it really it's is. relationship building. Part of what I also tell people is it takes time. Like one of my phrases is we only do business with people we know and trust. Right. So <clears throat> platforms can make trust happen quickly. You just talked about associations. They've done a little bit of the work for you because when those trade transactions have, you know, when you look at the numbers, the risk also goes up. So why play Russian roulette when you don't really know who's on the other side? Right. <clears throat> so what you're describing is what I'm also putting people in place to be ready to do. You have to build relationships ahead of time so that it can translate to business opportunities for you. But if you're, if you're pursuing business opportunities, but you're not investing in relationship, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. <laughs> when, <laughs> like, when, um, it's just like you said, when you have those conversations, when you're talking to people and they say, find me a market for this product. Um, well, um, thank um, you. There's market research involved, there's business intelligence involved, oh, there's gosh. matchmaking involved. So are you ready to cover the costs for these things? This is the marketing that you need to pay to have access to this market. If you're not ready, then let's table this conversation for now. I've got your products, I've got your brochure. We'll keep it in mind later on when, you have the, when you're ready. Until then, we'll just talk. We just talk. We'll invite you okay. to the event, but all we're doing is just talking. Let me also tell, like, I think I took notes of some some things people do that is that leads to um that doesn't lead to success for them one of the things people do i don't know i'm sure they do this to you like they reach out and say, oh i would i see what you're doing i would love to partner let's set up a meeting to talk about something right okay on the surface those reach out sounds plausible but enough times now i realize that it's very distracting like if people want to work with you, they can do their own due diligence to research you and research who you work with and come up with a proposal. Without even, before they reach out, they should have something their table, they're putting on the table for you to evaluate. But sometimes, not even sometimes, most times I see that they just want to pick your brain. <laughs> they just want to use your time and your mindset to help them advance something that they've not told you about. Have you seen that? This this is, again, uh, very normal. Um, they want to see if you can actually do what you say you can do. It's part of the whole process, but that's inquiry forms on our website. Okay, so you move You want to make an expression of interest. Yeah, you want to, I mean, you, you, I always find that we, we shouldn't make our business process an obstacle for them to do business. If anything, we should make our business process a facilitation to them to do business. So yes. you go on our website, you type an inquiry, an expression of interest, a letter of intent, send it over to us, and then we can move forward. If you haven't done that, then uh, you don't need I anything back from me. It's the same thing. Nazaro.com, we have our intake form. We have to filter those requests so that we are locating time and resources to genuine, because it's the if you if you want to be a part of international trade like this is just minimal requirement this is a long journey so if you're not able to to get over the first order of an intake form it just signifies you're not ready for the long journey you're not ready you're not, you're ready, not ready because yeah. this is not this is this is real <laughs> grinding like it's work you know, it's it's building an industry, it's building a business, it's export. And and for me, one of the other things I've had to do is to, to the School of International Trade is a lot of people, I also recognize the side that genuinely wants to learn, okay, genuinely wants to grow. And we've created a, a space for those types of people, right, where we're actually seeing results, where when they come to the platform, they're even buying and selling from each other. So there are transactions where we facilitate, but there are also transactions that because we've supported people with education and we've helped them structure, they're actually doing business and engaging without us, but they do it on our platform as well. So those are the yeah. things 
you know, so this is just fascinating to me because not everybody gets this, but, but you and I were like, of course, yeah, of course. We, we do this. I think for people who are just curious, that's what the curious. membership is there for. They'll just by themselves, they'll go talk to our, our members and they can go network for themselves. That's great. Yes. yes. But if they actually want to do business, then they need to understand that there is a natural process of doing business. Thank you. That's what that's what that's what the inquiry forms are there for. That's what the letter of intent is there for. That's what the terms of reference are there for. Go through that process, initial process. We vet each other. I mean, obviously, they'll think that they're vetting me, but at the same time, I'm, are they going of to course. be wasting our time? We are consultants. You don't like. It's like a lawyer. When you go to a lawyer, you don't go to him and ask him. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking about doing this case. What advice can you give me? Oh uh, no! No, you, you have to sign up to be their client. <laughs> exactly. That so, still happened today. When somebody, I'm telling you, like you and I could go on and on because it's like a mirror. We are explain, we are seeing the same thing. When the person said, Toyin, the last time we spoke, um, you said you were going to do X, Y, Z, Alpha. I'm like, whoa, 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 time out. <laughs> In my reply, I said, our conversation was only preliminary and exploratory. If you want to follow the process, you have to have an agreement in place. Like, I'm not yeah. going to put in any work for you when you're not my client. Yeah, like I think educating them about what we do is probably the next step. Yeah, and I think that's why we have all these events, all these summits. That's why we engage online so much. Um, we we're, we're trying to tell them what we do and the amount of work that requires to get that done. Mm -hmm. That's that's really important. When we go to these events and when we are invited by these um, dignitaries to explain mm -hmm. the markets, you know, uh, these things cost money. <laughs> <laughs> so um absolutely we have the support of the various governments but you know the hotel still costs uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the travel there travel. still costs yeah. the uh the, the time uh, the, the time, time. experience everything the time because you know when we're talking about international trade exactly. it's not just one city one town we're getting requests from people all over africa yeah. That's a, a massive market. All yeah. over China, that's a massive market. And now we have to pick and choose which ones are the most profitable. And that's really difficult. We may, I'm, I'm not perfect. I make <laughs> so many mistakes picking the wrong choices or choosing with something that's really viable, but it's going to take one year, two years, three years before mm -hmm. it becomes profitable. To exceed, yeah. So, I think... Yeah, I think one thing maybe I could suggest or advice would be um, building your pipeline, right? Your Absolutely. maturity pipeline, which is what I'm working on, where there are people ready today, but we're also going to grow people to be ready tomorrow, next year, two years oh, from now. But we're going oh, to keep them, we're going to keep them educated, entertained within us, um, my universe. <laughs> so we have the Nazaro universe. We have Absolutely. the trade network, we have the exporter listing, we have the TV, we have, I mean, TWA summits, AFCFT roundtable, on and on and on. We have various platforms to keep people engaged wherever they are at, knowing that over time, these groups of people would mature. Exactly. Right? That's right. So the people, you can't write them off. Absolutely. No, 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 no. We are even, we're growing people to be ready right? So that's one, 2021 for me, you're going to see me do a lot of teaching. I've, I've structured my calendar. I've sh shifted my calendar more. I, and, you know, before we joined, I was telling you things around events. The way we do events will be, will be more on demand, streaming it. Because what we found is as people are so overwhelmed and so busy right now, the old world of bringing people together, spending six months to promote something and bring them together, it's not happening anymore. So we are building content that people can consume on their bed, Friday, Saturday night at their own will because people are juggling just so much today. So I recognize that. So we're going to, we're taking time, we're saving time from those engagements and we're investing it in my community, the trade network. So membership, like we now have weekly programs training from e-commerce training to branding training to export development, um, AGOA training, ASCFT facilitation training. Now, a lot of times people don't know they need this training. They just want results. But I tell people what you desire, the business, 
um, results you desire is on the other side of preparation and work and relationship and network. So this middle um, point, I think, is what people struggle with. And, and I'm, I'm so glad to hear you actually also confirm that it's the same. I, I think that's why we work so well together. Um, I may not have time to do that, but I can ask, I'm more than happy to recommend them to yourself. Absolutely. Yes. Yes, uh, and you've done, you've done that. We, we did so with the Liberia Forward project. That was yes, perfect. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And um, part of what I discussed with him, I mean, I know now we're, we're public, but anyway, um, was also the team he was taking into Liberia. I was assessing them, their readiness level. And part of what I challenged him was to make sure they prepare because part of what happens is people go in unprepared and when they encounter one or two orders, they back out. They're like, what? You know, I'm like, no, this is <laughs> due yes, diligence. They back out. So part of what I'm sense. telling people is prepare. Yeah. Prepare for it before you go in. But this education process, it's it's all part of that process. I think that if we are better prepared from the very beginning, understanding these problems um, and understanding the costs behind these problems, then I think it's much easier when the project actually starts they are you can say well we we did that already so you're yes. comfortable i don't you don't need to pay me that you don't it's going to cost you a million during that event yeah when it actually happens but it's you know you, you pay that one amount. yeah you're, you're you're paying for the prevention costs now yeah but for people have to I mean, deal with sales, it. in sales and marketing it's easier to, it's a lot harder to to sell prevention than um you know corrective measures right yeah when, 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 that, when, right. when that crisis happens and people really need you and they're ready to pay anything it, like that's that's one of the rules of marketing like it's easier to tell people there's fire on the roof let's rescue you than to say hey why don't you learn why don't you um arm yourself with skills let me teach you what i know working for the world's largest retailer no, people, people like, no, no towing. We'll figure this out ourselves. And then they spend one year, two years. And I've seen this happen. After two years, they come right back. I and I tell them, that. <laughs> they come right back. When they and they've not made progress. That's it. That's it. It's well, sad. It's, like, it's sad. Well, then that's when the prices go up. So <laughs> Yes, you jack it up. Wow, this is fascinating. We've seen um, comments here. John, let me show you a few of the, of the sure, viewer sure. comments. I don't can't see. Oh yeah, I see. John was also one of my. Is 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 in DC. Um, they displayed under direct. I think he was talking about China. Um, China in terms of is it Ch John? Can you tell us more? Okay, and and Tama also talked about South African wine. So I think John, did you mean in terms of what's available from South Africa or what's available from? Um, China. I hope John is still online. So we're also seeing comments here. Um, so Tama is interested in South African wine <laughs> that we talked about. She also talks about sweets. Um, there's also comment here from Collins. Thanks, Collins, for joining. Collins publishes the African a lot. He says the disconnect is knowledge. I like that. Yes, Collins, and you do you do such a great job every day keeping people. Um, educated with your news alert. So Colin Smith um, distributes aggregated news sources for Africa every single day. And he always tags me on that. So people, and there are some conversations we are having as well to bring that to as many people are, as possible. So Collins, absolutely. Your work is also helping to close the knowledge gap. The knowledge and gap. I'm, yeah. yeah, and yeah, I'm interested. Yeah. He's a good lad, yeah. We, we've you, talked already about um, informing the information he provides, the media outlet that he provides, and letting people understand that there's not just one message out there, there's multiple. And because he, he collates and collects so many different um, um, perspectives, you get the all the information that you require, at least the surface information that you require. Obviously, there's going to be a, a much bigger, deeper dive once you start uh, going into specific sectors. But I think that's the, the the very first port of call is Africa's alert, Africa alert. Yes. So Collins, thank you so much for the work that you do. You you have some, like you're getting a rave review right there. So keep it up. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, there's also comments saying thank you so much for sharing such an inspired insightful thoughts. Looking forward to see your book with lots of details on this issue. I do have some sketch 
um, some things in my book, but hey, it might still take a couple more months, but um, I need to give more time to that book. So thank you so much for those kind words. Um, we also see Mr. Tom saying, nice information, great. Um, Chi, Chi Nozo says, US-China trade war has no effect on Africa. It is welcome development. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, on the surface, yes, but again, when you lose numbers, when you're doing X and, and, and one of your biggest trade partner decides to, to um, remove a leg from your table, your steady table where you eat from, you've got to steady that table and you've got to look at um, opportunities for, future, for the future because you won't want it to happen again. And Africa represents a landscape that is important for, to China. That's it's, it's it's important. It's it's surprisingly important to every market. What I've enjoyed, well, I don't want to say enjoyed, that maybe that's the wrong word, but what I've seen uh, during this trade war is we're now getting two markets competing for African resources. We we take a look at two trade deals and we're able to say which one's best. Okay, now we can have these guys bidding for the best. Yes. Deal. So why not stay in the middle and oh okay this person's offering us this can you offer us better this exactly. person's offering us this can you offer us better so because of this we can make a lot better trade deals for ourselves so we should pay attention we shouldn't get sucked in either side i don't think that's good but i think having a own africa perspective on those issues helps us build better trade deals yes, for and ourselves. i like to talk about yes I like to talk about it through the lens of, in a funny way, I say it's like Africa having many boyfriends. <laughs> you get to pick, you know, you get to pick, you know, and you, are, you get to negotiate um, in terms of what works for you. Um, and those boyfriends, they may not be happy with each other. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> you are the price. That's not really our problem, is it? Uh, it's not really our problem there. <laughs> We're um, <demand. laughs> That's I funny. Think, Let's show. Um, yeah. Um, there's also any thoughts of reaching out to the Caribbean to develop more yes. trade, travel, and training opportunities for the masses in that part of the diaspora. Um, do you want to say something about this before I respond to that? Yes. Uh, you know, in, in China, because of the diaspora is so mixed, um, we work with Haitians, uh, folks from Trinidad and Tobago, Jamaica. There's a restaurant that opened recently in Shanghai uh, that features Caribbean cuisine. We're working very closely with the director there, who's um, definitely showcasing and actually being used by the various uh, Caribbean embassies to showcase Caribbean culture for the Chinese market. So absolutely, we're engaging with them. There's a shared history. There's a shared heritage. So yeah, in China, we're definitely engaging with Fantastic. various yeah and i think one one of the other things that is that has to shift here in the us is that the ambassadors and i do work with some of them they need to leave the comfort of washington dc and come into real america right because the work in the private sector in terms of opening restaurants and um spreading the um the awareness of what their nations and representing their nations. It's not just DC, they need to do that. They need to do it in Chicago, in Arkansas, in Wisconsin. They need to do it around the US, whether in Silicon Valley, in Texas, like they all need to have an active presence there. So, so you see, that's so exactly one of the, the reasons. Same we have the I'm same sorry? In China. We have exactly the same problem in China. You know, when uh, dignitaries come to, to China, they're, they're going to Beijing, but the actual economic trade partnership is in Hunan, which is mm. the other side of China. So, um, and you know, Shanghai is the international capital. Guangzhou has the largest uh, port. The, um, the Guangdong uh, area has um, the, the biggest um, container hub in the world. So, you know, th to, to understand these various different markets and why each area is significant for your traded item or service, it's important. It's the same in America, as you said. Yes, it's the same. And that's why we actually engage with the policymakers as well to educate them in terms of 
um, they also, like we said, being present to showcase and tell the story of their people and to promote, you know, I like to call it under the umbrella of export promotion or investment promotion is that there's a policy component representative, there's also the private sector and they need to work on in that. Um, and then lastly, I'll share this one. Toyin, you're doing a good job and I like the fact that your focus is on the long term. When you build, build to last. Yes, yes, yes. Wow, if you see the work that we're doing at Nazaru, you will realize that um, we're building platforms that you know people can then use those platforms to amplify their message. Because when we started, <laughs> you know, it's a whole lot of work to get the type of attention you need for conversations around Africa in the US. Um, for example, Bloomberg. Um, when 2019, when I was hosting the trade with Africa and hosting the ambassador for African Union coming in from Addis Ababa here in Chicago. I reached out to Bloomberg in Chicago. They have a big office, but guess what they told me? Well, Bloomberg Chicago doesn't cover African affairs. You have to reach out to Bloomberg South Africa to cover that. This is Crazy, right? Like I'm yeah. here with you in Chicago. The event is here in Chicago. It's relevant to the US government and African government. The ambassador so spend, for the 55 countries in Africa is visiting Chicago for the first time. And Bloomberg in Chicago is telling me they cannot cover that story, that I have to talk to Bloomberg South Africa to cover a story. There's a problem. So for me, that's why we've built our own platforms. We're not going to wait. We have Nazaru TV. We're going right. to build our own platforms. We're going that's to build right. our own institutions because this conversation is important to a million, not even a million, a billion plus people and growing, right? That's right. This conversation Absolutely about right. trade with Africa may not be may not be important. I recognize that it may not be seen as important to America yet, but we're building it just in time, just in time. And I want to use this opportunity to also celebrate and acknowledge all the leaders, like the CEO of Walmart that gets it. He gets it. He was the head of international for um, for Walmart, and he gets it. He visited the continent. He's listened um, to Scott Ford um, today. The today's show was sponsored by Westrock Coffee to those leaders, to Donny Smith, to Dale. So, you know, so I recognize that there are so many other leaders that get it, and we focus on them. But there's so many more that really they even don't get it. But we're not waiting. We're going to be keep building. Um, and I want to thank everybody that joined us. And Sam, thank you so much. We continued this conversation. Such a great um, partnership connecting with you and the great work you do in Shanghai. Thank you for yes, thank yes, you please for share really your last it. words. Share your last words. And no, I really appreciate this opportunity to talk about the various trade opportunities available. You know, 2021 is going to be a big year. FOCAC, uh, the Forum for China Africa Cooperation, that's going to be launched this year. Uh, that's the in, in Senegal, that's that's going to be uh, the China-Africa cooperation in Senegal. That's in November, and of course, uh, we'll be working with Nazaru all along the way. Uh, so we're looking for more opportunities to uh, facilitate trade with the AFCTA and so on. So yes, could you say a little bit about the Belt um, Silk Road? Oh, the Belt and Road Initiative. Yeah. Yes. So we there are a number of different um opportunities along the silk road for uh obviously going to be maritime silk road for african uh, nations the belt and road initiative um will be managed by a variety of different chinese mm. institutions where mm. the african chamber of commerce is working with the investment association of china which is managed by the NRDC. This is the organization that manages China outbound investment. So we, um, and the, the China Africa Development Fund as well, the director of the African Chamber of Commerce is working closely with uh, the director of the China Africa Development Fund. So there are a number of different expos, different events, different summits that are going to be taking place. Participate, tune in, find out how you can be a part, also learn more about um, the different nations, how you can work with them as a um, African nation with China or Africa, the China South South Cooperation, which is um, China and another two emerging economies working together. So there's uh, so many different opportunities around the Belt and Road Initiative that wow. um, we just got to tap into it, be educated, take the opportunity. 
Yes, yes, it's exciting time, I think, for us. We're just at the beginning of what we say. When you think about the innovation curve, we've, it hasn't normalized yet. Um, but this is a good time to jump on board. And if you're in the US, Canada, I also know people reach out from Latin America and you want to learn more about trade with Africa, please do check out um, nazaru.com. And your website, do you want to call out? Is it a AFCHAM? AFCHAM yes. China. Yes, www.afcham, A F C H A M, African Chamber, afcham china.com. Org, org. Uh, get the information that you require, sign up, register to our newsletter, or get in touch with me. My name is Sam Ananda. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm more than happy to uh, learn more about how we can work together. I'm very Fantastic. open, approachable. And, uh, yes, yes, he is, he's quite personable. Yes, yes, you are. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you so much. Um, I have a few announcements, but thank you again. See you soon and talk to you soon, okay? Thank you. Bye. Awesome. I hope you guys enjoyed this today's show. Um, this live stream is also going to be available on nazaru.tv. So it's www.nazaru.tv. And next week, I'm going to have my good friend, Kit Sims. He's a very great friend. Um, we're going to talk about technology and our sourcing models for Africa. He is, um, a, you know, He's, he's just amazing in terms of the work that he does, working with CIOs and chief information officers across the U.S. and also recruiting technology um, skills for them. So next week, we're going to talk about um, technology innovation and opportunities um, when it comes to trade with Africa as well. I want to also say thank you again for everybody who joined us live and most especially our sponsor today, our lifetime sponsor, Westraw Coffee. Um, if you're interested in also featuring your brand and sponsoring each of our um, weekly engagement, please do reach out, info at nazaru.com. Again, my name is Toyin Yumesiri. It's been a pleasure and an honor to have this conversation with you. And I'll see you again next week. Thank you so much. God bless. Bye. I firmly believe that any man's finest hour, the greatest fulfillment of all that he holds dear, is that moment when he has worked his heart out in a good cause and lies exhausted on the field of battle, victorious. At West Rock Coffee, we celebrate the determination and spirit of the people of Rwanda who help us make the finest coffee in the world. <laughs>